Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 86 with David Stein from Money for the Rest of Us. It's time for a new American dream, one that doesn't involve working in a cubicle for 40 years, barely scraping by. Whether you're looking to get your financial house in order, invest the money you already have, or discover new paths for wealth creation, you're in the right place. This show is for anyone who has money or wants more. This is the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How's it going, everybody? I'm Scott Trench. I'm here with my co-host, Miss Mindy Jensen. How are you doing today, Mindy? Scott, I am having a lovely day today. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. We just had a, a wonderful discussion with David, who is clearly an incredibly sophisticated, smart uh, investor who really has a good, solid intellectual basis for what he's doing and why. Yes. David reached out to me a few weeks after Aaron Lowry did I say her name right? I always mess it up now. A few weeks after Aaron Lowry's episode, uh, where she was explaining the basics of investing. And he said, you know, that's great. I love her book. I recommend her book. But how do you know how to choose what kind of investment to even start with? You know, I think that would make a great show. I'm like, hey, I agree with you. I think that would make an awesome show. So we uh, connected and now He's here today to talk about different ways to invest and let you make decisions, informed decisions, once you have all the facts. Yeah, and, and shout out to that episode with Aaron Lowry. Um, you know, Virginia, my girlfriend, said that was one of her favorites. So she really got a lot out of that. And so if you or someone you know is, you know, still still learning about investing and kind of needs an intro, that might be a great one to come to 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 dive into and then follow up right away with this episode, which is kind of, I think, maybe more higher level, more advanced, maybe a discussion today than the one with Aaron. Yes. And that was Aaron's episode is episode 81. So you can find that wherever podcasts are or at biggerpockets.com slash money show 81. All right. Well, should we bring in David and, and get going? David Stein, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. How's it going today? Uh, wonderful. Thanks. Can you walk us through where your journey with money begins? For sure. We, I grew up in Ohio and I was a single family household. So my parents got divorced when I was young. And my first experience with money was not having very much at all. And knowing that we, you know, probably the first time I realized we didn't have anything was, you know, we'd get food deliveries, we had food stamps and welfare. But it was just kind of the fear that my mother had because she was always trying to figure out how to make money. I mean, she did all kinds of stuff. She sold real estate back when interest rates, mortgage rates were 15%, right? So that didn't go too well. She made dolls, she cleaned houses. And, and so growing up, I, I, I wanted to have money. I mean, I, I thought, and it, you know, we had a house, so it's not like we were on the streets. My mo and my mother always said, you know, if we didn't have that house, we would be on the streets, but we had that. And there was, I was probably about 10 or 11. I was, I was reading uh, the newspaper, Cincinnati Inquirer. I was a big Reds fan. And there was a full page ad for this guy had a motorhome. And he's like, you can make $100,000 a year. You can have a motorhome and travel all around the country. This was, this was sort of the late 70s. And I'll show you how. And I convinced my mother to, to buy this thing what i didn't know what it was like just the secret now i think she was interested and i was interested and it ended up being a, a basically books on how to do advertising and so you know from there is kind of a, i started trying to launch businesses from really a young age and so that's kind of where the story of money began realizing we didn't have enough and that the way to solve that was to figure out how to 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 run businesses what sort of powers of persuasion do you have that allowed you to convince your mom to buy a motorhome when you were 10? I mean, that's really I don't think, impressive. I don't think it was my, I think it was my <laughs> persuasion. I think it was the copywriter of that full page Cincinnati Inquirer ad. I showed it to her. She <laughs> read it. I read it. And, you know, maybe, I don't know. I mean, it's probably, a, it might have been over $100. And, and then he sent me these books, most of which, I didn't really understand, but it was sort of like, oh, I could solve this problem in, in my life and, and not wait for somebody else to solve it. And you know, that resulted in a series of mostly failed businesses. I mean, back then there was no internet, so you know, I'm running ads in the 
in the classified. I'm doing handwriting analysis. I'm trying to do, I'm washing windows. I mean, there's a combination, but surprisingly, most of it was information products. Like I offered to, to do research services. And, and generally speaking, nobody bought anything, which means I wasn't a very good copywriter. But that, that desire to kind of control my own money destiny never really left. Did, did anything of this work out or what was the kind of position that, that you kind of maybe left high school or entered the next phase of your life in? It, it didn't, I mean, it didn't, I got experience. So, I mean, that worked out, mm -hmm. but no, I mean, I mean, I, well, I mean, I cut long. I mean, the things that worked out best were the ones where I was trading time for money. Right? Mm -hmm. I was washing windows, but things that leveraged sort of information products, you know, they, they didn't really work out. In high school, but again, I'm I'm in high school. So after high school, I actually worked for a year, washing dishes at a hotel, which was also very eye opening. Cause that, that was sort of again time for money. And uh, but eventually went to college, and I studied finance. I mean, what I found interesting, I remember going to college and like introduction business. I I didn't give a whole lot of thought to college, so I thought, I want a job, I'll study business because <laughs> businesses give jobs. And they, they had introductory speakers and a stockbroker stood up and said that he made $100,000 a year. So he even kind of had that six figure number again. I'll study finance. And unfortunately, I realized that I actually liked aspects of finance. And, and that's kind of eventually ended up in the investing business and, and learned to, to actually manage money professionally that way. What was your financial position graduating upon graduating college? Did you take on student loan debt? Did you were able to get a job that immediately paid you pretty well? What, what did that kind of look like? It, uh, well, I worked all through college. So I, I went to University of Cincinnati undergrad. I went to Miami University graduate school. But yeah, I, we, I guess fortunate enough, we were poor enough and they were still grants. So much of it was grants. There were scholarships. But I, I left school with about 10 grand in loans after graduate school, which, which wasn't bad. You know, my, my in-laws helped, my, my father-in-law said, here's 10 grand, go to graduate school now. I went to graduate school with six kids and, and you don't wanna do that. So just go, go now. And, and so that helped. But at the end of the day, yeah. So, I mean, and then I got a job. I mean, I didn't know anything. I, I graduated from, with an MBA and I went to the placement office and I got a job in, basically the credit analyst. And so it's very different. Like my kids now want to get jobs. It's very, very different. And my jobs, I had two jobs, adult life. One I got from the placement office. The second, the investment firm I joined, I answered a classified ad and stayed there 17 years. And then my third job is what I do now. So I'm not, I'm not the person to go to for how to get job advice. because <laughs> I, I did it the traditional way. No, absolutely. So, so what was your kind of approach to money uh, with these for this first job and at that second job over the, like, like what are the kind of the milestones in terms of changing your thinking around money over this part of your career? Were you consistently saving? Were you, was there a aha moment where you really stepped on the gas? Uh, did you take on any more debt? Was there, what, what was kind of your approach to money throughout this portion of your career? Well, in, in the early years, we made mistakes like a lot of people do, you know, and got into debt cars with health like health club type thing and you know so we had consumer debt and it wasn't until so i you know i spent three years at, in corporate and then i went to this kind of this small 25 person investment advisory firm and there you know i spent a lot of time you know i could i took a pretty big pay cut i wanted to go in investing so so badly that i i took about a 50 percent pay cut to join this investment firm but they promised double digit wages or raises over time. And so really, you know, I learned more about money, spending a lot of time with investment managers, looking at how they research stocks and look about hedge funds and just observing, you know, a lot of it was just observing how I, I work with a lot of not-for-profit boards and observed how, how the wealthy react to money and how they act around money and what do they do in, in terms of money. And that, you know, they're not these stuffy rich people. They're actually very giving people that is giving their time and their money to causes. And so, you know, ultimately it, we got out of the hole because we increased our income You know, I became a partner at our firm. And so it was not th this, you know, with the, the fire movement where they're saving 40, 50%. We didn't do that. I mean, we, you know, ultimately I 
been with my firm maybe five years and I was a partner and we sold it. And then three years later, we bought it back at half the price and took on a bunch of debt, a bunch of leverage, and that worked out. Mm -hmm. And then I got to the point, you know, I was in my mid forties, like uh, I hit my number that I could retire. And so I quit. And that's been seven years ago. That's awesome. So it yeah. sounds, I mean, it, it, what it sounds to me like is, is you took a, a big risk in joining this firm and then got on, got on the ground floor and then helped grow it and really intrinsically understood the value of the business as well, along with the other partners. And that was, was <clears throat> perhaps a primary driver in your, in the uh, creation of a lot of maybe your, your net worth over the, over that period of time. Is that right? It, it, that's true. Because, and it was, I mean, it, it might not seem like a big risk now, but at the time, you know, I was working for AT&T Capital. So I was a big corporation and you had to tr climb the career ladder. And the idea of joining a 25 person firm, at least to me that come from kind of a traditional mindset, like why would you do that? And I remember reading an article by the, the management guru, Peter Drucker, and he talked about gazelles versus, I think it was elephants, right? And that a gazelle, is going to run fast. You're going to get way more opportunities. And so that, that convinced me, okay, I'd be willing to take this cut and try this. And I quickly found that you realize in business that many people, they don't, they don't want to share their ideas. They don't have ideas and that people that share ideas and that want to create value, they get rewarded. And so with, and especially with a small company where people can see, I mean, there's not that many people, they can see when you're adding value and ultimately that, that helped. And then we took another big risk when we, you know, we signed personal guarantees to borrow a bunch of money and millions of dollars to buy back our, our company. And there's always some luck involved too. I mean, in terms of what I did there, I launched an, an asset management product that did very well. That became close to a third of our firm's revenue. So there were things that worked out along the way. It was being aware and taking advantage of opportunities that did show up. All right. So, uh, I mean, it sounds like a, a wonderful career here. What prompts the decision to retire and, and go to the, what, what was kind of your thought process in moving away from traditional employment and, and, and your career with this firm? Well, I remember this was probably 2011 and we were having a, an annual client conference and I, I was speaking, I was one of our keynote speakers. And I, and I remember giving my speech and when you give a speech, sometimes you, you kind of have basically your voice in your head is, is, is talk chattering to you as you give your speech. And it basically said, like, you've topped out at this firm. Like, all right, you're already the keynote speaker at your client conference. There's hundreds of people there. You're giving a speech. And like, what are you going to do now? Because, you know, I could just keep doing what I was doing and kind of wait out the clock and do a traditional retirement. But my biggest fear is that... And what if somebody sued us or something bad happened? And I kind of knew what my value was because, you know, we had an operating agreement. And I, you know, I was also, it was stressful to manage money and to be compared, you know, against a benchmark every week and try to outperform. And I, I just got to the point where I remember being, I was just giving a speech in, in California and I saw our numbers for that particular week and, and the performance, it wasn't good. Yeah, you know, that month we're having a tough year, and I thought, you know, I'm done. Like I, I, I know what it's worth, and I, I talked to my wife Lapre. I was like, and she was always very supportive of quitting. Like, yeah, go do it. I mean, you've talked about this for years. Just go do it. So I booked a red eye flight, and I showed up at our, our weekly executive committee meeting where, and I, and I told him I was done. And I, I mean, I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew that, you know, in my mid forties, like I didn't want to do what I was doing for another twenty years. Got it. So how long were you retired before you jumped back into the workforce? Well, we told our clients I was retired. I mean, that was, but the reality is I launched the website on a plane coming back from my retirement party. <laughs> and, but it, <laughs> the problem was I launched an investment newsletter, an investment site, and, and I, I hated it. I, it basically I had recreated my same job, but I wasn't getting paid. And, and I found that I was afraid somebody would hire me or, and I wasn't even an investment advisor. I just, I just sort of didn't know what else to do. And so I, yeah, I literally launched that. And that went on for two years, starting stuff, 
shutting it down. I think I probably started and shut down five different websites over a two-year period just because I, I never got comfortable. I mean, I, I knew I wanted to, I got tired of saying we as an investment advisor, right? We think this, we think that. And I wanted to say me, but still saying me, I think this was still a little terrifying. And it took me a while to get used to that and to figure out a way how I wanted to do it. And, and finally, it was probably early 2014. I started writing a regular investment column for a personal finance column for a local newspaper. And I became a guest on, on a podcast, uh, Matt and Andrew's podcast, Listen Money Matters. And they had me on and I didn't know who they were. And I just, I was a guest. We talked and I thought oh, that was kind of fun. And I kind of missed the teaching aspect of investing. And so it was probably a few weeks after that, I launched my podcast money for the rest of us. Just try it out. I didn't know what it'd be like. And I found I, I enjoyed it. And, you know, from there I'd learn, I like the teaching and that's what I do. That's what I do now. I teach through video, audio and, and writing. Okay. So money for the rest of us, who are the rest of us? Who are we, that, who are we uh, excluding? You know, it's not defined. <laughs> I, uh, Bernadette you, uh, she's a branding expert that came up with the name back in uh, 2014. She's like, you should write a book. Here's what you should call it. And, and that was kind of my question to her, who's the rest of us? And she said, it's who, it's how people interpret it. And in, in my mind, it's, it's us, it's individual investors, right? It's not wall street. It's, it's people that are trying to learn how to invest, to be better investors, to be better at personal finance. That's the rest of us. And so I guess you could say we're, we're excluding, you know, the, the hedge funds out there, the, the wall street firms, that, you know, not that they're necessarily bad people, but they're not us. You know, they, they have much better resources. They have quantitative algorithms. They have bots. I mean, they invest very differently than how an individual should invest. Got it. Um, so so is, would you say that your, adv your advice is mostly tailored for, uh, to, to folks that have something to invest? Maybe let's call it like 10,000-ish or more to begin investing, or is it, is it even with the first dollar? Uh, that you really kind oh, of no, I, I think it's for the first dollar. I mean, I've done an episode on how to invest a hundred dollars because I mean, now, you know, fortunately, I mean, you can buy an ETF without paying any commission. Our commissions are, are, are very low. I mean, there's apps out there that you, you can use to start investing and, and it's very much the same principle, whether you're investing a dollar or whether you're investing a million dollars, it's the same investment principles. And that's what I teach. I try to teach in principles. Awesome. So what are some of those principles? What are the things I should be thinking about if, I, if I'm thinking about re, you know, taking control and investing my own money in, uh, with, with total control? Well, the first thing you, you should ask yourself whenever you invest in anything, you should be able to answer the question, what is it? You should, you should be able to describe in detail if you're talking to a friend. I had a college client and one of my first endowment clients. He, he told me, he says, I'm not comfortable investing in anything that I cannot explain to somebody that's not on our investment committee. So if I can't explain it, then we shouldn't invest. And that process of explaining an investment, it keeps us humble. And they've, they've done academic studies on that. You know, when they ask people to explain something as simple as a zipper, you know, how does a zipper work? They, they find it's very difficult to do. So we, we think we know more than we, than we do. And so, I find that the beginning investors get in trouble because they go into an area and have no idea how it works. I mean, trading, right? I was talking to at a conference this past weekend and I was talking to one of these online learning platforms. They said the number one course that's selling on their platform is on trading securities, right? It was dumbfounds me because if, if, you know, why, you know, where else other than I said poker, cause I asked this before, can you pick up a tennis racket and start playing with professionals? And that's what trading is. You're trading against professionals. So the first thing you should ask is what is it? Be able to explain it. And from there, another question should be like, who am I competing against? Who's on the other side of the trade? If you're buying a car, you know, who's selling you the car typically, and you know what their motivation is. But with many investors or real estate, right? Typically you have some idea who's selling the real estate or why are they highly motivated? If they're highly motivated, you can get a better price. 
But many investments, people go in, they buy a stock, they buy a cryptocurrency, they have no idea. They don't really think, why is that person selling that to me? Or who, who is selling it to me? And when it comes to individual stocks, it's typically an institutional investor that's running an algorithm, which means they're going to know so much more about this company and its correct price than we would in buying it. So, so yeah, I, I think those are two great questions. I think that the, a natural problem that is kind of coming in my mind from that is suppose I'm new to investing, you know, those seem like huge rabbit holes to go down, even to kind of just understand what one company and all of the companies in the stock market does and how they make money and all that kind of stuff. And then who on the other, and then to figure out who on the other side of the equation is that. Is there kind of a, 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 like an introduction or, or guide that you can kind of give us that of how to very simply go about those if, you're, if I'm just trying to get started with my first couple hundred? All right. Yeah. First, don't buy individual stocks, right? Buy, go to your 401k. And look what the options available if you have a 401k. You know, what, what is this fund? And you, and you, read, you read the, the material. Because I, I don't buy individual stocks. You know, as, as individuals, we should focus on asset classes, which are basically baskets of securities that create a return. Because one of the things that we want to step back and ask is, you know, is this opportunity, is this an investment? Is this speculation or is this gambling? And, and the difference is the, the expected return. You know, real estate's an investment. Why? Because it has income, right? And as a beginner, we know we can look at something and say, is this going to just have a dividend? Am I going to get some income out of that? That's an investment. The speculation is where you have to be precisely right. And there's some disagreement whether the return is going to be positive or negative. You know, Bitcoin is speculation. You know, there's no income to Bitcoin. It's just, it's going to go up or it's going to go down based on whether people will buy it. And then you have gambles, which has a negative expected return because we know so little about it, let's say, and we get taken advantage of. And so we lose. And a lot of trading is like that. And so we can start simply by focusing on, you know, what are the opportunities in your 401k? You know, what is that basket of security? What is that asset class? I mean, you can invest with two ETFs. You can buy a global, the VT. You can buy the Vanguard Total Global Stock Market ETF. You can buy a bond version, and that's how you start. Mm -hmm. So one one of the things I, I I also invest almost exclusively in index funds and and mm -hmm. uh, and stock stocks, real and real estate as my two major asset classes mm -hmm. um, for a lot of these reasons. I, I, don't, I wouldn't have articulated them like this before talking to you, but I love these, these concepts. When I invest in an index fund, I am investing in a broad set of companies, I'm investing in a huge portion of the, 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 the public marketplace. So I, I don't have to know what each of those companies does and what they're doing to answer, I think, satisfactorily the question, what is it? What is the ETF? What mm -hmm. is the... the um, the, the, the thing I'm investing in. And because I'm, uh, you know, who's on the other side of that? Well, it's the entire market of buyers and sellers of securities in the, in the overall broad U.S. stock market, if I'm buying a broad U.S. stock market ETF or index fund, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm really avoiding having to do some of the, the, the really hard stuff that the professionals are doing on the trading or gambling or speculation sides of the, the piece when I, when I invest. Would you agree with that as an analysis? Oh, absolutely. Of kind of why that yeah. would be? Because you're, you're, you are buying the broad market. Because, and so you don't, for example, you don't care whether the stocks are priced correctly or not. When you're, when you're buying an individual stock, right, that, that, there's some pride there because you're saying that the market is wrong, that they have priced this stock wrong because the value of a stock is basically the value today of all its future earnings. And that's what the market is. The people are transacting and they're saying this company is worth this amount based on our expectations of how it's going to grow in the future. And so when you buy an individual stock, you're saying they're wrong. I think it's going to do better than everybody thinks because if otherwise, if it doesn't do better, then it's not going to outperform. And so by buying an index fund, you don't have to read the paper anymore. You don't, have to, you don't care about what individual companies are. Because some are going to do better than what people think. And that's what's going to, they're going to want to appreciate a bunch. 
Some are going to do worse than what people have priced in, and they're going to do worse. But overall, that cancels each other out, and then you benefit by buying an index fund. What drives the return of an index fund? Let's say a U.S. index fund. It's driven by the dividend, the cash flow, and it's driven by how that dividend grows over time. So that's the second thing. And then it's driven by, you know, what's the value individuals are putting on that? Are they paying more in terms of the price to earnings ratio or less? That's what drives the stock market. And that's what it comes down to be able to explain what an investment is. One of the things you, you should be able to explain is what drives the return? Well, it's, it's income, the growth in income, and what people are paying for that income. Are there any circumstances that would make you buy an individual stock or recommend that people, you know, oh, if this happens, if, if you see, you know, something that would make you recommend buying an, an individual stock versus an index fund? Just for fun. Sometimes it's fun. But other I than agree. that, I mean, I, I drove, I test drove a Model 3 Tesla the, uh, last weekend. Uh, this is so cool. And I've driven them before, but the Model 3 was, it was just amazing. I mean, you could see this is going to change how people drive. And I thought, maybe I should just buy Tesla stock. Now, a year ago, I did a, an episode on electric cars, and I made the case for why not to buy Tesla stock. And then I, you know, as I went through it again, I stopped myself. I was like, you know, I have no idea. You know, Tesla's not making any money. You know, there's risk. And, and, but sometimes, you know, if you bought the Tesla stock and it did well, it's like, yeah, you could tell people, yeah, I, I did well on it. And it kind of participated it. I'm, but Tesla doesn't even see the money, right? I mean, this is all trading in the secondary market. I mean, that's not money going to them. But for most of us, no. I mean, you do it maybe for fun. Sometimes you have to learn by doing and realize how hard it is to invest in individual securities. But I, I spent years trying to identify money managers that could outperform the market. I mean, that's what we did. We had 20-person research group. And there, there just aren't that many. And so how are we going to do it as an individual? Yeah, I, I find that the stock picking and this kind of like exercise and analyzing a company and seeing if they'll do well is a really good way to motivate, for example, a teenager or a student mm -hmm. or a very you know, young person who's just starting the career, a college, college student or something like that, um, to get them in, interested in investing in the first place. But I really don't think it's a good way to, it's not how I manage my money to, uh, for the long term in terms of returns, because I just don't think that I can outperform these professionals, these traders who are, are looking for these undervalues and really kind of honing in on these, these price points for exactly the reasons that you're talking about. But it, is, it can be fun every once in a while, like you said, to, to buy an individual. Well, right. And I mean, there, there's so many other asset classes one can learn, right? That, that's why if you, if you focus on individual stock, I mean, you can learn about real estate. You can learn about closed end funds, which you know, we don't necessarily have to talk about today, but they're a type of mutual fund that's extremely inefficient because it's driven by individuals. Who's on the other side of a trade when the, with a closed end fund is like a mutual fund, but it trades on an exchange and typically sells for a discount to the value of the assets. And it's, it's individuals that are on the other side of the trade there and they panic and they dump their assets. And then suddenly you can pick up a real estate closed end fund for you know the value of the property is is worth you know 80 cents on the dollar in terms of the values there and so i mean there's all these other asset classes that people that like to invest can learn about now if you don't like to invest stick with stocks stick with you know passive real estate and and go on with your life <laughs> well, well that's oh go ahead mindy i asked that question because i wanted to hear it from you a uh what i consider to be a money expert saying, no, you shouldn't buy individual stocks unless, you know, it's just for fun. I will give you one caveat. You should buy one share of Berkshire Hathaway B stocks so you can go to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. You could, and you can learn, I mean, you can learn from investing from, from Warren Buffett. I did an episode recently, should you hire Warren Buffett to manage your money? And I evaluated, oh, I'd love to. I evaluated Berkshire Hathaway as a money manager. So if they were a money manager, you know, what would you look at? And, and at, I, at the end, I concluded you would not hire them as a money manager because they don't have a, a succession plan, right? They're very talented, but they're also very senior. They have a ton of cash that they can't put to work because they don't have enough good ideas and they can't put their money to work. 
in terms of opportunity. So, you know, if you were hiring, if you were an endowment hiring a money manager, you wouldn't hire somebody that didn't have a clear succession plan and that had too much capacity. In other words, they had too, too big, too much assets under management that they can't get it to work. Huh. But you can still learn a lot from Warren Buffett in terms of how he goes about it. Yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. Let, let's go into some of these other asset classes that you mentioned around uh, that you can, get, you can get involved in. What is your opinion for of, of, uh, of considering real estate, for example? Or, you know, you mentioned closed and mutual funds. I've, I've never heard of that before. Can you kind of give us a list of, of other uh, areas to maybe kind of consider if you're interested in more than just index fund investing in, in a stock? Well, I, 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 you know, we've not talked about bonds. I mean, people should own bonds. Right. You can buy. I mean, sometimes people want to save for their house. Right. You can't you don't want to put your down payment money in stocks or tie it up in real estate. And so you people need to understand what bonds are. They're debt instruments. They and they're you know, for all for all asset classes, there's rules of thumb that you can use to figure out what the potential return is going to be. So bonds, the, you know, every bond fund or ETF in the U.S. has an SEC yield. Right. It's a basically it's it's a percentage basis. So right now, the Vanguard total bond market index fund has an SEC yield of about two and a half percent. And that is a very good estimate of what that bond fund will return over the next seven years. Right. I mean, it, that's just the way the math works, because bonds is driven by math. Well, you can buy a cash and earn two and a half percent right now. You can buy a very short term bond fund and get a CD. So why would anyone buy the total Vanguard bond market index fund when you can get the same return just by owning cash. I mean, the only reason you would do it is because you believe interest rates are fall because the way bonds work is they, the value does fluctuate as interest rates rise and fall. And a Vanguard fund, that one is, is just more sensitive to those changes. So if you believe rates are going to fall, then you buy the fund. But rates going up or down, that's a speculation again, right? Because you have to be exactly right and you primarily own bonds. I own bonds because I want the income. So I care about how much income I'm going to get. And I want the safety of principal because if I'm saving it. Or I like the optionality of bonds. I like to own bonds because someday the stock market is going to fall. And it can fall 50 to 60%. And I would like to have some assets so that I can rebalance into stocks for. So bonds is an asset class. You know, real estate, you know, most people aren't going to buy rental real estate. Right. And so you learn about real estate investment trust, which is a basically you can buy a REIT exchange traded fund or a REIT index fund that owns hundreds and hundreds of real estate projects around the world, office buildings, apartments, et cetera. That's another one. Now, go ahead. Oh, no. Do, do you invest in REITs or real estate? I do. I do. So I, you know, I, most of my real estate exposure is through REITs. I've owned rental real estate in the past, but I found it's a lot of work. I didn't like it. I couldn't find a property manager. And so I actually, most of my real estate, private real estate, it's actually debt financing. So I've lent on a 12 plex, for example, to where I, you know, they're paying me, I'm basically the bank. And I, I prefer that way versus actually owning that. But yeah, I own REITs. I mean, I, if you look at my portfolio and I, for, for my membership community, I share everything that I own so they can see, you know, here's my asset mix. Here's the securities I own. And, you know, I have well over a dozen different asset classes. You know, I own gold as a speculation. I, you know, I distinguish here's an investment it has income and it's positive expected return. Here's a speculation where there's some disagreement, but you know, I own artwork and just a, what you want is a variety of return drivers. You know, many different things, that you don't have to predict the future, but you benefit as things happen. So yeah. let's go back to a REIT because we, a bigger pocket started out as, well, started out, it still is a real estate investing education site. And as the market gets hotter and hotter as real estate investors or more people start investing in real estate, deals get harder to find. How do you select a REIT? What are you looking for and where do you buy them or invest in them or whatever? Well, when, I, when I'm talking REITs, I'm talking public, there's private REITs and there's public REITs. So public real estate investment trust, and I don't select a REIT. So a REIT is one company that trades on the stock exchange 
and they're buying, they might have a dozen properties that they own. I'm buying a, a REIT index fund. So it owns hundreds of REITs, in which case they own hundreds of properties. So you don't, I mean, you can, Vanguard, I believe has a REIT index fund. Uh, I, you know, Schwab has some, has a very inexpensive REIT ETF, the Schwab real estate. So I mean, I just buy it. iShares has REIT exchange traded funds. And so you don't have to be analyzing specific REITs because you're buying the overall market. So what drives the returns of REITs? Because we want to know well, what, what's the upside. Well, public REITs right now have a dividend yield of 4%. So that, that return's locked in. And then the overall return over, a, let's say, a 10-year holding period will be driven by that dividend yield and how fast that dividends grow over time. So if REITs grow their dividends at 3%, let's say, then you have a 7% return baked in. And then the third variable would be are people 10 years from now paying more for REITs in terms of how much they want for that cash flow or they're paying less. So that will influence it. So that's what I do there. Now, private REITs, you know, a lot of the crowdfunding platform offer private REITs. And I don't, I haven't invested in them because you mentioned that the, the real estate's expensive and they're, they tend to have a little higher return because they're using more leverage. Right, your average public REIT has about twenty-five to thirty percent on of leverage. A, a a public REIT does a private REIT uses fifty to sixty percent leverage, so they're going to have a higher return because they're taking on more risk. And the problem with private REITs is they're not liquid. Right, you can't get out. You basically you can get a little bit out every quarter, but you have to make it's like a three-year commitment or longer, typically. But I, I think REIT's a great way to invest in real estate if you don't want to go out and buy individual properties. Because you're right, right now, the, the cap, capitalization rate, so basically the yield on private properties is as low as it's ever been historically. So, I mean, it's not that they're going to fall in price, but if the yield is that low, that means your, your expected return is going to be much lower. Yeah, and, and I, I would say, you know, look, I'm, CEO and president of Bigger Pockets here, and I would say that you really shouldn't invest in real estate privately in rental properties unless you expect a return that is significantly greater than what you can get in these other asset classes, such as a REIT, which is totally passive for you as an investor, or the stock market, or bonds, or whatever other asset classes. You only invest in real estate if you think you can get substantially higher returns, at least real estate that you can control as a rental property, especially if you're going to self-manage and owner oper operate, right? You must, like I must get a 15, 17% expected return in average market conditions to be, to be, to invest in real estate personally. Otherwise it's just not worth, worth all that extra effort. In my opinion. Well, exactly. And in fact, you know, my view is that, and they're, they're hard to find. I mean, back 10, 15 years ago, you could buy a rental property where the cap rate was 10 to 12%, right? Now the average apartment cap rate is five. In here at a college town, they're selling for four. And, and why would I, if my yield is 4% and I got all the expenses and all that stuff, I mean, a lot of times I think people talk themselves into real estate deals because they factor in the leverage. Well, no, that the deal should stand on its own and be competitive without without leverage at all. And then you decide whether you're going to lever it up or not. I mean, most people do, but if it, if just straight paying hundred percent equity for the deal and its yield is four or 5%, I wouldn't touch it. And so that you should be looking, my view, you should look for nine, 10% and, and they're hard to find. No, I, I, I would agree. I think that, you know, there's a, there's an interesting risk in the commercial real estate market right now where, where cap rates are extremely low and interest rates are extremely low. So what happens if both of those things begin ticking up, right? Which, you know, that, that is speculation, as we mentioned earlier, but that's going to really put a lot of, you know, it seems like that risk is increasing. It can't go down much further, it seems. No, I agree. I, I invested. You know, I, guess I guess I could, but. I, I, no, I a couple of years ago, I, I inv there was a friend, a guy I knew, and I got to know him, and he was doing an, a, a student housing project. So I, I bought a share in his deal. and. He died like within a year and there wasn't really, there wasn't a real good, um, there was no succession plan, which is why I didn't put that much money into it. Mm -hmm. But so another project team came over and they started doing sort of these worst case scenarios. And I'm looking at their worst case scenario was that cap rates would go to 7%. And I said, well, what if they go to eight? 
And it's like, well, they'll never go to eight. Well, you know, they've been eight six years ago. And they've realized that, no, well, they'll, they'll lose money because as the cap rate goes up, the value of the property is going to go down and they would have a hard time selling it. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I think you're right to be, be very aware of cap rates and interest rates because it does impact. Well, well, let's, um, you know, this, we can go all day about commercial real estate markets. I think that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of risk there. Um, in, 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 and you got to know what you're doing, which is why you should listen to the Bigger Pockets real estate podcast uh, for the mm-hmm. commercial uh, real estate side of things, especially. Could you, could you just kind of maybe walk through quickly the, that list of 12 asset classes that you're in so that we can get an idea for that? You've got bonds, real estate, stocks, REITs. Uh, I don't have all 12 in front of me, but I can name some other ones. So, you know, something I've invested in this year is preferred stock. So preferred stock differs from common stock because preferred stock has a promised dividend payment. Uh, you know, typically they're yielding five to 6%. So they yield more than REITs. And a preferred stock doesn't ever expire. So like, they're like a very long-term bond. And so they're, they're much more sensitive to, to interest rates. So in this environment, when the Federal Reserve is suggesting they're going to start cutting rates, you know, I didn't want to buy, we talk about speculation, right? I don't want to buy long-term bonds because I think rates are going to fall because they, maybe they will because you only get, like I said, a 2.5% yield. But I'll buy an asset class if I'm getting a 6% yield. So I'm collecting that income. And if rates fall, the value of that's going to go up. So that, that's an example of an asset class. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we move on to the next one, how do you buy preferred stock versus common stock? They, they trade on an exchange. So there's, there's preferred stock exchange traded funds. So okay. you can buy a preferred stock index fund. Now, the, I made an exception this time because I bought the, the challenge with preferred stock is most of the issuers are, are banks. And I didn't. So if you're buying an ETF or an index fund, it's going to be mostly banks. So I actually bought the preferred stock of, I mentioned these closed end funds. So these closed end mutual funds they also are leveraged up. So they've issued some preferred stock. So, but I knew the company and I, you know, I was felt, I was comfortable there. Cause, cause again, with this preferred stock, I'm not having to predict the future. I'm not for saying this company's priced wrong. I'm saying they've issued a security that pays a 6% dividend. I know my risk is if the, the actual closed end fund falls 50%, they might suspend the dividend for a while, but then they have to catch it up. So you, you always have to look at what's the downside to an investment. So the preferred stocks and asset class I, I've bought recently, I've bought mortgage REITs. So we've talked about re- equity REITs where they actually own the real estate property where there's something called mortgage REITs where they're actually buying mortgage backed security bonds and then leveraging them up. And we won't have to go into a lot of detail, but, but there's all these little niche asset classes that most people don't have to necessarily invest in. You're fine. You want to do stocks, some cash, and you know, maybe you want to do real estate, some REITs, you don't, you know, bonds. So that, that's all you need. But I like investing. So instead of learning how to do individual, to buy individual stocks, I'd rather focus on different asset classes. And that's what I teach anyway. So that's what I spend time doing. Do, do you do any investing in private assets? I do. So, you know, at my okay. old firm, we... I launched a number of private funds. So I, they're called fund of funds. So I'm in venture capital. I'm in leverage buyout funds. They have some farm loans. They have energy and, and things like that. But I don't, I'm not picking individual private deals per se, other than, you know, occasional real estate type thing. But I, I do think, you know, once you have sufficient assets, it's helpful to have things that aren't tied to the financial markets. So own some land. Right or own some. I mean, if you don't want to manage real estate, we own some, some just, just some land. I mean, if you own some farm land, even though we don't lease it out, right? Tax is really low. You just have something as kind of a store of value. One one of the things I think is is interesting is, you know, you your first thing is what what is it? Can you explain what you are investing in to a friend or to someone? You know, whatever. And I think that you know, a way to get around that is again, to go to these index fund investments, these very broad asset classes that kind of get the average return of an, of a given asset class into your portfolio. But the exception, you know, you, you made this exception yourself when the preferred stock 
uh, uh, fund that you that you're that you're investing in seems to be in those very few areas where each of us seems to have an individual competitive advantage in understanding things. Mm-hmm. Your company uh, preferred stock. If you know that there's a good there's a reasonable risk behind that, and you can explain what's going on there. Or you know, I know some folks that are that uh, uh, are are high net worth individuals here in Denver who are able to source deals that they can invest in basically as private equity partners um, or mm-hmm. angel investors. And those can be, I think, they're not excluded by your, your philosophy here. But again, it's like that, that very bit selection with a portion of your investment portfolio in these, in, in perhaps these private things that are not, um, that you can really understand and articulate very well. Is that, would you agree with that? No, I agree with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, my stage, I have about 40% of my assets in private stuff. So, you know, maybe 10% in kind of the private equity venture capital, but a lot of it's sort of these direct deals where I've lent, you know, asset-based lending is what I call it, where there's an asset, I've done lending on it. And so I, I think people have, but I think you need to understand whether, you know, do you have an expertise, right? And start small and always look at what's the worst case scenario, you know, how much could I lose? And with speculations, Bitcoin, for example, you, the assumption is baseline assumption, you, you could lose it all. So you want to keep those speculations very, very small. Yeah. So I'm not a huge Bitcoin fan or Bitcoin fan at all, but I also cannot explain it, uh, which is why I don't invest in it at all. What makes Bitcoin a speculation rather than a gamble in your mind? Well, a gamble is something that has a negative expected return. So you, you know, over time, you're going to lose money on it. And whereas it's, it's not completely clear whether with Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin, if people trust it, then it will probably do fine over time. It's volatile as heck, but there's not an embedded loss. An example of an, an asset, for example, that has a negative expected return is, is binary options. You know, they're, they're an option contract where you pay a premium and if things, if you, if it works out, you make a hundred dollars. If you don't, you lose a, basically you lose your premium. Well, you know, a lot of binary options trade on exchange. So there's somebody, there's another individual on the other side, but many trade on, you're just trading with another firm, right? So if you're trading, it's like going to a casino, right? The casino has a negative expected return because if it was a positive expected return, the casino would go out of business. So if you're trading binary options with a private exchange and that's who you're trading with, that exchange, you know it has a negative expected return because otherwise they'd be out of business if it was positive because they have to have a positive expected return. And that's why it's always important to look at, well, who am I trading with? What's their motivation? And, and what informational insight do I have to suggest that I can earn more than they did or more than the market? Man, you're just going to crush so many uh, folks' egos who invest in these in these little niche things. Like, hey, I'm investing in gold, or I'm investing in binary options, or you know, whatever. Oh, this is going to, you know, I, I, but I, I I own gold. I mean, I, but it's classifying it right. I own yep. owe gold coins and gold ETFs, but I know that it's a speculation. That I have to be precisely right. That ten years from now, people are going to want gold more than they do today. So I will, I mean, but there's people that that take their entire retirement and have put it in gold or Bitcoin. And that's crazy because you want the workhorse of your portfolio should be the income being generated from an asset class where that cash flow is growing over time. Love it. I could not agree more with with that statement. I I have a little bit of a reputation for for trashing gold a little bit, not because I don't, I, I think it will rise with inflation over time, more or less. Um, it's kind of maybe may, it could even be better than a currency. I just feel like long term, you know, and, and this is a bias perhaps to my personal investing and in life situation. The long term return of a of, of holding gold for me, I think, would would result in less wealth than putting that equivalent amount in an, in a stock index fund. Even though I know I might have more volatility or uh, whatever over the long. Well, term. it probably will, right? So you own gold because it's an option against uncertainty, is how Jim Grant puts it, right? that then everything's going to fall apart. Right. So I, I own gold because, and you know, I keep it, you know, in a safe deposit box somewhere and just in case, right. I mean, I don't know, but I, you know, over time, it probably will not beat the stock market because there's no income to it. 
So if it beats it, I don't want it to beat the stock market because if it does, that means life is not going to be good for us because something is very, very wrong. <laughs> yeah. I agree with Scott. I except I don't own any gold. Um, gold hasn't really risen in price over the last. I mean, it's like stayed the same with little ups and downs, right? Uh, it's yeah, of, it's at a six-year high this year. But is it? it yeah, it, you know, gold does well when there's unexpected inflation or when there's huge geopolitical risk or you know, we won't get into how the, the monetary system works, but you know, money, money is essentially worthless, right? I mean, it's not backed by anything. And so there's the idea that here's an ass, here's, here's a chunk of rock that people have valued for millennia. And if suddenly people lose trust in central banks and all currency, what, what are they going to go to? They're going to gravitate toward things that are real. That could be land, could be real estate, but it could also, but it's kind of hard to carry around land, but you can carry around gold and maybe it'll be Bitcoin. Maybe people will trust these digits of Bitcoin. I mean, they definitely use it in Venezuela right, right now. I mean, people, you have super high inflation. People store their wealth in Bitcoin because they can quickly switch it over to, to Venezuelan currency. And, and buy something because prices are rising to strata, you know, very, very high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, so I, I looked up, uh, I, I recently had a debate on the bigger pockets forums with a user who was claiming to have discovered a new way to cash flow gold, um, <laughs> which I, I disagreed with. Uh, it was basically like uh, sell calls at a certain point, buy gold, sell calls, and you'll get the income from the calls. Unless I was like, well, if the gold goes down, Based on the way this is working, it's not going to work. Anyways, I, I won't go into. Well, I wouldn't. No, that would. I wouldn't yeah. do that. I, I was not. I was not <laughs> pleased. I was not uh, happy with the strategy. But basically, I kind of looked at it. It was like gold is actually a remarkably volatile asset. It's gone up and down over the last hundred years by you know four, five, six times. Um, a couple of times at various points since you know late, early nineteen. Oh, it has. It has. Or there's times where you weren't allowed to own gold. Right where they froze the price and they confiscated gold because it's so it's it's a controversial asset. But and I have about four percent in gold, mm-hmm. another two percent cryptocurrency, and I just you know I put it away and ignore it. <laughs> because if it does well and you don't own any, you'll feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that okay, that is a good point. I don't own Bitcoin because I don't understand it at all. But I remember when Greece and was it Greece and Italy? Greece was having its horrible uh, currency issues. And that was when Bitcoin had gone up to the previous high. It was like $6,000 or something for a Bitcoin, um, mm-hmm. I think. And that was people from Greece would put their money in Bitcoin. And then, like you said, with the Venezuela, pull it out to buy something and, you know, put it back because it was a more uh, or less volatile uh, currency than their own currency. Um, and, in you know, but as it's going up, you're like, oh man, remember when it was a thousand dollars three weeks ago? I wish I would have gotten in then. And I was just telling myself, yeah, but it could easily be you buy it at a thousand and then it goes down to 20. So. Well, right. And that's why it's a speculation. So it's sort of minimizing your maximum regret and the idea that, okay, I'm going <laughs> to feel bad if like, my wife, LaPrell, is like, well, why didn't you sell Bitcoin when, you know, it got up to 19,000? Well, one, I didn't know it was going to fall. I knew it was probably a bubble, but I would have felt bad had it kept going up. <laughs> it went down a cup by half. I didn't feel bad because I already had set my allocation. I knew, you know, I bought this. I'm going to hold it for 20 years to see how it works. And so I don't want to, if, if you have something that's not a big part of your portfolio, there's no reason to sell it, but it depends on how your, 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 your mind's made up. I feel bad missing out on something than I would taking my profits. She would say, just take the profits and go buy a piece of land, whereas I would feel bad selling and then know it doubled or tripled. That's interesting because I, I feel bad. I, I, at least I'm trying to train myself this way. It doesn't always work out this, this way in practice, but I feel bad when I feel that my decision wasn't based on the most on the best mathematical case for the long run for my investing portfolio. But I think that in reality, I'm more like you where I'd be upset if I missed out on, <laughs> on, on a good bet, even if it wasn't, it didn't fit 
fully in with my like, oh, long term, I think the stocks will beat gold or Bitcoin or whatever. Maybe so. Maybe there is. I, I think there's actually some really good. There's some really great stuff here for this discussion. I'm gonna have to go home and think about and figure out if I'm gonna change any of my. But no, I think I think you're right. Right. In fact, Danny Duke, I, I talk about this in my book. She she talks about a good decision is not the result of a good outcome. You know, whether the outcome is positive or negative, that that isn't what makes a good investment decision. It's it's whether you had a good process for making that. Right. So you have a good process. I mean, you're looking at this the right way. You know, what is what is the driver of the stock market? Okay, if I see what drives return the stock market, the, IVIC, the dividend, the income growth, et cetera, that's, those are better, that's a better foundation than buying gold where the return driver is people paying more in the future. Mm-hmm. I mean, between the two, you buy stocks. You buy gold in case the world falls apart, but not too much. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, we'll have to go look it up, but we actually interviewed Annie Duke on the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. She's one of my favorite authors, so I'll plug her book, Thinking in Bets, uh, right here on the show. Go check that out. That's one of my favorite reads I've read in the last couple of years. Uh, Non-Bigger Pockets reads, of course. Um, and then uh, I'm also dabbling a little bit in poker as a result of what she's been talking about, which I classify, according to your schema here, as gambling appropriately. So. Uh, oh no! I, I, she's she's delightful. She actually endorsed my book, so she's on the front cover endorsing my book as a very good investment decision process. Fantastic! So, that's a that's a a stellar recommendation right there. Uh, and the Andy Duke episode is episode two ninety seven of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Investing Podcast, which can be found at biggerpockets dot com slash show two nine seven. Okay, David. It appears that we have come to. That time, the famous four. These are the same five questions that we ask all of our guests. Are you ready? I am ready. I don't remember the fifth question. So four, you said four questions. Five. It's, it's four questions and a command. Yeah. Okay. Sort of. So what is your favorite finance book? So my favorite book is Anti-Fragile from Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And you know, he's, he's a difficult read but I like him because he's really changed the way I think about investing ever since his first book comes out. And, and the biggest takeaway from that book is ruin matters. As he says, he's effectively organized his life that that sequence matters. And, and the fact that, you know, when we do things, why we do things. And if there's a chance of being ruined in a particular deal, such as putting all your money in Bitcoin or gold, you don't do it. So we need to always avoid ruin to, make sure that we live another day. That sounds awesome. I've not heard of that book. I'm going to have to go check it out. What is your biggest money mistake? Well, my most recent, my most recent money mistake is one of my biggest. Uh, you know, I always, we've bought a lot of used cars in the past. And three years ago, I bought a, a BMW 650i. I talked about it on my podcast because I, 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 it was a fast car. It would be fun. I thought, you know what? It's already taken a 50% depreciation hit. It'll be great. I, I just traded in for a Prius because one, I just got sold a lemon. Two, it, the price dropped like a rock. And I ended up spending, I threw 20,000 miles. I spent $1.25 a mile on that, which is about twice what I've ever spent on a car on a per mile basis. So that, that's the biggest uh, mistake I've, money mistake I've made recently. All right, here's here's why I love this mistake so much. That is you have articulated out exactly how much money you've lost on a per mile basis in great detail, right? <laughs> who who categorizes that level of detail around the mistake? I mean, that's got to be a contributor to your your the, the reason why you've been so successful with money over over a long period of time. Well, I I yes, because I like to know what am I paying, we've done this with all our cars, you know, our typical car in our Honda Odyssey is probably, you know, we drove it 160,000 miles. We ended up, you know, it was like 28 cents a mile. So when I have a car that suddenly cost me $1.25 a mile and it, yeah, it stings. So yeah, I calculated it. And I, I mean, I felt bad trading it in on the Prius because, you know, my daughter will drive that in college. And people say it's my car. It's like, you know, that's no, not really my car. I don't have a car because, you know, I, I, I messed up on my car. I don't get a car for a while. <laughs> not even the Tesla I test drive. We won't get that one. But I, I even factored that one in. You know, leasing a Tesla, a Model 3, 
it will run about 83 cents a mile. So cheaper than this used BMW that I lost, that I lost my Wow. Mind. So Scott, you are asking him, wow, who does this? Who calculates it out by the mile? I did. Did you not? Because you're just as much of a money nerd as... I, I, d- I have not done that. So, <gasps> I, uh, but, I will, but I do think that my car is probably one of my bigger financial mistakes, but it was a little bit lower scale. I, was, I bought a new, new Toyota Corolla. And I probably should have bought a five or seven year old model when I when I first started out, and I would have been up ten, twelve grand. Yeah, but still, as far as money mistakes go, I mean, there's some there's some whoppers out there. Uh, because, because I now drive a five year old Toyota Corolla 2014, I feel like if I were to compute my cost per mile, it's got to be in the lower end of the spectrum. So maybe that's why I haven't done that. Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, yeah, how many miles uh, do you have on it? Uh, like thirty thousand. 30, 30, uh, you're, you're probably still up there. You got to hold it longer. Yes. <laughs> but you'll get, you'll get down under 30 cents a mile. And you know, that includes gas and insurance too. So. Yeah. If you're interested in kind of diving deeper into this, uh, listeners, uh, on the, on the d- discussion around the nuts and bolts in this, uh, I'm sure David, you have a lot on your website and podcast, but Mr. Money Mustache has also done an interesting study that kind of resonated with me around how, if you buy a new car, you're basically purchasing 20 years of car inventory which is a really inefficient way to build, to build a business, for example. And there's a lot of mathematical uh, in, uh, uh, concepts that kind of derive from that, that, that make it kind of, that help make this, the case very strong for used vehicles and those types of things and, mm-hmm. when you're making a decision around this. Is this the new cars and auto financing article? I don't know. I'll, we'll, I'll find it, then I'll link it to it. Yeah, we'll put those in the show notes, which can be found at biggerpockets.com slash money show 86. Okay, uh, David, back to the actual show. Uh, what is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? Well, it's what we talked about in this episode. Be able to, whenever you're starting out, ask what is it? Be able to explain what the investment is and how it's going to make money. You know, even if it's, just, if it's the option within your 401k understand what it is before you invest. All right. All right. Uh, uh, what is your favorite joke to tell at parties? And this is the hardest question of the famous four. Yeah, it actually is. I'll tell you, let's see. I'm going to see. I hear this as a popular joke. So you let me know if people have told it before. So there are two muffins <laughs> in the oven. Do you know the punchline yet? No. All right. Two muffins in an oven. The one says to the other, ah, it's getting hot in here. And the other says, hey, a talking muffin. Oh, <laughs> nice. You're definitely going to get a, a rise out of the audience with that one. Oh, hey. God, Scott. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, David, here's the command. Tell me where people can find out more about you, please. Oh, yeah. My, my website's moneyfortherestofus.com. So that's where you can find out there. And in my book that's coming out is, is basically goes through 10 questions you should ask anytime you want to invest. It's money for the rest of us, 10 questions to master successful investing. You can find information on that at money for the rest of us book.com. Wait, when does that book come out? October, October 25th, 2019. October. Awesome. Uh, awesome. And you can pre-order the book money for the rest of us book.com. And we'll link to those in the show notes as well. And again, the show notes for this show can be found at biggerpockets.com slash money show 86. Yeah. And, okay. And that book is coming out in October, you said? And that book comes out October 25th. Okay. Awesome. David, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. And this was really informative, all these different ideas and like principle number one, be able to describe what you're investing in. You know, I hear a lot of people in, you know, my, on Facebook, I see people saying, you know, oh, I just bought X. I'm like, why did you buy that? That seems like something you heard. And, you know, I'm going to start asking people actually, can you explain what this is and see what they say? Because that's really, you know, that's a really good indicator of, do you even have the knowledge to be putting money into this? You can lose everything if you don't know what you're doing. I really like that idea. Yeah. Well, we don't, the, the, the challenge is, is that that idea, we don't think about losing everything, right? When we buy something, all you can think about is that feeling, what's it going to feel like when it goes up. Oh, and yeah. I, I've got to. Cut the process. Just thinking it's going to go up makes us feel like we know more than we do. 
I've won the lottery about a thousand times in my head. Every time it goes up really high, I buy one ticket and then I don't win and I'm always surprised. But <laughs> but you do it for the entertainment values, right? And that's and that's like, lotteries are gambles. And the only reason you gamble is for entertainment. But you don't want to be entertained by losing money on your investing. You want to you want to do that. You do that for gambling or you go to Las Vegas. Yeah, and I don't really gamble that much. My my in-laws live in Las Vegas. I'm there a lot. I'm there a real lot for somebody who doesn't gamble. Um, but yeah, the uh, I never buy a stock, buy an index fund, invest in real estate thinking, I hope I lose everything. So. <sighs> no, but the entertainment, just is the lottery, right? You get more satisfaction out of the thought of winning that that is worth what you get at that is worth more than the price of the ticket. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Right? The thought of that I could win is worth more to you than, than the amount that you than know you are lose buying the ticket. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I couldn't buy like five lottery tickets. That's, are they $2 now? That's like $10. I can't put $10 in there. I don't want to lose $10, but I'll lose $2. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is David Stein from Money for the Rest of Us. And we're out of here. Thank you, David, for your time today. Thanks for having me. All right. That was David Stein from Money for the Rest of Us. Um, wow. What a great discussion. What an, what an insight, what an insightful commentary. What's some great rules for investing and a whole bunch of new asset classes to think about and explore if you're uh, like me and, and, and we're kind of new to some of those things, but thought you were getting a pretty good grip on maybe real estate, stock investing and bond investing. Yeah. You know, his number one principle, be able to describe in detail what you're investing in is like, it's so simple, but it's so mind blowing. If you can't explain it, then you should not be investing in it. Not until you can explain it. Uh, Bitcoin, I have no idea what it is. I mean, I, I know what it is, but I don't know how it works. I don't understand it. Frankly, I don't care. I don't want to invest in Bitcoin. It's very volatile. It's too volatile for me. Um, so I don't invest in it, but there's a lot of other people that I know who are investing in it and I know they don't know what they're talking about. And that just makes me a little scared for their their experience coming up. But that that right there is like the number one tip we can take from this is be able to describe what you're investing. And like you said, he gave us a lot of different uh, new to maybe new to you ideas and new investment classes that you can go and research and, you know, figure out, hey, is this something I want to do? Is this not something I want to do? But I, I love this episode because it just introduces some new things that we haven't talked about before. Yep. And I'll say that I feel like I have a reasonable understanding of Bitcoin and what it is and how it's used. And I, and I feel like that is why I do not invest in Bitcoin. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, I think, you know, I, I think to go out by, by once every, you know, six month tirade against Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is one of hundreds of cryptocurrencies right, which are used leveraging a technology called the blockchain. The blockchain is a very valuable technology that has a lot of applications and a lot of business things. Bitcoin itself is one of hundreds of fabricated theoretical currencies that you could apply value to. For example, Target, not Target, uh, Kodak created a Kodak coin a few years back to, or maybe last year, that was a new cryptocurrency that could have been just exactly like Bitcoin, right? For, you know, they would more specifically for photograph photography related purposes, but the, the, the currencies themselves have no intrinsic value except in how individuals trust them as currencies. So there could well be a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of these other currencies that's a leader one day that takes over a large portion of international trade but who's to say it will be Bitcoin or Ethereum or a new one that doesn't exist yet, right? It's going to be one of those that's going to attract, in my opinion, most of the market share. And I have no reason to suspect that Bitcoin would be it if that ever exists in the first place. As a United States citizen, if you try to pay me in Bitcoin, I'm going to refuse you and I'm going to ask you for dollars. So for now, <laughs> I have a practical application for Bitcoin and I see really long shot odds of any one specific currency actually becoming a de facto world currency that's used uh, to a great extent. Could be wrong on that, but that's my understanding of Bitcoin and that's why I do not invest.
in Bitcoin. And you do make a good point. I use Bitcoin interchangeably with cryptocurrency. It's just easier to say Bitcoin than cryptocurrency. So I think most people, when they're talking about Bitcoin, they actually mean cryptocurrency in general. Um, either way, I don't invest in any of it because I don't understand it. I was going to invest in cryptocurrency or speculate, as we should say. Uh, I would try to do it in an index fund of cryptocurrencies to de-risk that concept I just talked about of Ooh. Bitcoin maybe not being the one that wins out in the end. Maybe it's Ethereum or maybe it's one that we haven't even been invented yet or one of the th hundreds or thousands of small ones that have value currently at close to zero in aggregate. But you just don't know. And I think that there's a lot of, a lot of challenges around that. So tirade for, against Bitcoin over, tirade against gold happened today. There you have it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of gold either. Um, and I thought that I had read somewhere that gold has like hovered around like $1,200 or $1,500 an ounce. And I remember in the 80s, it was also like twelve or $1,500 an ounce. Um, I am just going on memory though. So please, if I'm wrong, don't send me 3,000 emails telling me how wrong I am. Um, you can send them to Scott instead. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Scott, should we? I-N-D-Y at biggerpockets.com. <laughs> All right. Well, should we get out of here, Mindy? We should. From episode 86 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, I am Mindy Jensen. He is Scott Trench. And I don't have a snappy comeback today. So goodbye. <laughs>